Statistics show that 40% of small and medium businesses in the US alone go out of business after a disaster, with 25% of those reopening closing down again within a year. A well-prepared business continuity plan that includes a disaster recovery strategy is crucial to ensure long-term growth and success. But try to discuss disaster recovery with your company and you'll notice how organization leaders usually adopt one of the following opinions. Either they don't care about disaster recovery or they think disaster recovery uh, strategy is super expensive. And the reality is everyone thinks that adopting a disaster recovery strategy is expensive until they have a disaster. The same way uh, some developers might think that writing tests is optional or some managers think that writing tests is just a waste of time until something goes terrible wrong in production and it's Friday afternoon and there's no tests. But by lowering the barrier to entry, cloud computing has made DR viable even for small and medium businesses. And so in this video, I will provide you with a blueprint you can apply in your organization today. A plan that contains expected business outcomes to share with your organization leaders. It contains a step-by-step -step guide to how to define a tailored disaster recovery strategy to your needs. And so once your strategy is done, well, you still need to drive adoption in your organization. And we'll touch on that as well. We'll touch on how you can successfully drive adoption as well, and even how to automate the whole process so you don't have to worry about a disaster occurring anymore. And although some technical knowledge is preferred, no AWS expertise is required to take advantage of the learnings of this video. My name is Elias, I'm a cloud architect. Now let's do this. Now let's look at this swim lane diagram showing the high level task associated with defining and implementing a disaster recovery strategy for databases on AWS. You can, by the way, download this PNG file below. I'll just check the link in the description. So on the left, we find tasks that I believe should be owned by the solutions architect. And on the right are the ones that should be driven by the application owners. We'll talk more about those in a second. But the process starts, you know, in my opinion, with the solutions solutions architect who designs the disaster recovery strategy, a design that should be based on functional and non-functional requirements. And we've touched also on those in various videos, like the one you see in the pop-up banner right now. They also should be based on industry standards, business realities, business challenges, on timelines, and also on other parameters that are highly related to the organization you're within. This first step is then followed by a joint effort between the SA and the application owners, which are developers, team leads, software architects, you know. So these owners join efforts with the solutions architect to choose the right database, the database that fits best your RPOs, your RTO requirements, and all the other requirements that you have collected. And the good thing about AWS databases services is they all provide backup and restore functionality, all of them. And that's a great start. But for more details, I prepared this mind map for you and you guys know how I love mind maps. Now, in this mind map, I tried to map, I started mapping all the features that AWS offers in their purpose-built databases. For example, RDS, uh, you can see here the engines that it supports, use cases and features. Let's start looking at the engines first. RDS supports MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, blah, 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 blah. From a read replicas perspective, well, MySQL supports cross-region read replicas, but only if it's limited to five instances. If you need more, up to 15 instances, you want to go to Aurora. And so you can see how mind maps, as a way of gathering information, serve um, have a great advantage, uh, especially when if you are talking to your customers and you need to quickly navigate through a ton of data and try to find the right use case. Or you're working with developers and you need to choose the right database or building a solution, you need to choose uh, the right features. So th this is why I love mind maps. And so to download this, check the video description and you will find the link there. But I wanna push this a little bit even further just for the community as a whole. And I will publish this 
in an editable mode in a, in a GitHub repo. And I would love it if you can contribute to this document to keep it relevant as a living document so everyone can take advantage of it. So I started doing the same for RDS, for Aurora, Neptune, DocumentDB, Dynamo, Redshift, but it's not the final list. And as I said, let's make this a community effort. I think it would be a great addition to Solutions Architects in their day-to-day -day lives. Let's go back to the video now. Okay, the strategy is defined, the right database is chosen. Now it's time for you as the Solutions Architects and also the initiative leader to start the process of driving the adoption of the strategy throughout your organization. And there is a lot to say about driving the adoption of a solution. That's why I dedicated a whole chapter to it in SA Magic, which is my signature program where I accompany IT professionals to transition to the role of a cloud solutions architect. And if you're interested in joining the program, I'll leave a link in the description below as well. But I'll also take you through five steps you can use today as an organization leader to drive adoption. Although I'll have to go through them quickly and for more details also just watch the video that I will recommend at the end of this one because that's where I'm gonna go deeper into how to drive adoption in your organization. So the first thing you want to do, the most essential thing that ensures that everyone understands the goals, everyone understands the objectives of the initiative is to communicate the new strategy clearly and you should do so by using a variety of communication channels to try to disseminate information about the new strategy, such as emails, newsletters, town halls, video conferences, meetings, and such. Second, now, as a leader of change, as a leader of transformation, you should emphasize the importance and the urgency of the new strategy to motivate the organization to adopt it. Number three is about, well, you, you know how people are fearful in front of the unknown, right? So sometimes when it's a new technology we're introducing, providing the necessary training and support goes a long way in helping the organization understand the new strategy and implement it effectively. Number four, um, you see people I worked with will tell you how I love doing peer programming sessions joint code review sessions and other activities that require put it on my software developer hat. In essence, if you've been talking about how, for example, infrastructure as code is awesome and trying to push the organization towards it, being seen console clicking is not ideal. So you want to lead by example. And I've seen this my entire career from people I admired and people I learned from. One of the best ways to demonstrate your commitment to a new strategy is by actively participating in its implementation. Step five in my drive the adoption uh, plan involves tracking key performance indicator, uh, soliciting feedback from stakeholders, making also changes to the strategy based on new information or changing circumstances. In other words, regularly monitor progress towards the new strategy and make adjustments as necessary. Again, I had to go quickly through these five steps not to make this video too long. But at this stage, as solutions architects, we have to make a choice. Do we stop here and call it a day? You know, after all, we've done so much already. We defined the disaster recovery strategy. We chose the right database. We planned and supported engineers to migrate to the new database. But if you watch the video so far, it's because you want to go the extra mile. You want to stand out from everyone else and you want to deliver the best results you can, right? So hit the like button which tells me to keep making similar videos and let's get to the exciting stuff, automating the whole process. So you don't have to worry about a disaster occurring any longer. And so by the end of this part, you'll understand completely how to ensure your organization's recovery with minimal manual intervention. How? Because automating your DR strategy isn't just about having backups, it's about achieving a more robust system through detection, failover, and the power of AWS service APIs. You got it? All right, let's talk about event detection first. Here, the thing that might come to our minds is health checks, correct? 
The reality, it's not merely about, you know, heartbeats. It's about rather real-time evaluations of your connected application components. Remember that, because with automated detection, you shorten recovery time. You can optimize your RTO. You can add a layer of insurance to your disaster recovery. However, as with any automated uh, form, it brings the risks of false positives that can trigger a necessary failover, which is not exactly cost efficient, right? But you know, I, I don't want you to worry there. There are strategies like adding manual overrides into the workflow to prevent unwanted failovers. So I just want you to remember to take advantage of resources like the AWS Health Dashboard to stay aware of events and stay aware of disruptions affecting your account. So if I wanna step back and just summarize this part, Use monitoring, but don't just use it as a way to get health uh, heartbeats. Use it to continuously monitor all the components of your architecture. And now we can talk about failover, because irrespective of your disaster recovery strategy, whether it's backup, pilot lights, warm standby, multi-site, and we've made videos about these in the channel already, just search for them. You should consider building custom disaster recovery automation to ensure the smooth transition to the disaster recovery region during a disaster. There are two things you absolutely want to do. Change your existing CloudFormation stack Terraform stack, whatever you use, change it to export information about your databases, including the instance names, including the endpoints, so your automation process can refer to these exports values within a region and perform operations that will help you uh, in your disaster recovery operations. And second, if you have resources that are in production, but don't have an associated CloudFormation stack, you should focus on creating stacks for those resources. I know I probably lost a couple of you there and this sounds highly technical, but the idea is basically you want to automate your stack and you want to ensure that the values are exported. That's it. When you have met these two goals, you can build automation solutions in the language of your organization choice to take advantage of CloudFormation exports and automatically perform the cut over actions required in the event of a disaster. Let me give you an example here. Imagine having an Elastic Cache for Redis a global data store deployed as a CloudFormation template. In case of a disaster, your automation code, your automation script can automatically promote the secondary data store to the primary data store. That's powerful and it's only the tip of the iceberg. But to summarize, the key to automating the use of AWS service APIs lies in turning your database infrastructure to code. That's it, that's the missing piece. That's the thing that a ton of organizations struggle with. And the other thing, you wanna remember that your automation solution must be scalable across multiple databases. So leverage tools like AWS Tip Functions, tools like AWS Batch, you know, these, these tools are there to help you excel in building your strategy. Okay, I think we've learned a lot so far and I am going to stop here because well, first of all, I don't wanna overwhelm you. This is really technical and technical content doesn't work in YouTube because a lot of people don't know that they have this type of problems, right? And also because my previous disaster recovery videos never really did well, so I don't think uh, that it's something of interest to you. Uh, but if yes, uh, please give the video a like, uh, let me know in the comments, for example, so we can keep exploring the subject of disaster recovery and it's still in covered principles like testing the strategy, drift detection, observ observability, and much more. The only metric that I have to know that these things are interesting to you so I can keep serving you is likes, shares, and comments. Once again, I'm Elias, a cloud architect with a single goal to make your life in the cloud a whole lot easier. If you enjoyed this journey, do hit that like button, subscribe, and let's continue exploring the cloud together. Now we've briefly touched on driving the adoption. And if you want to learn more about how to successfully drive the adoption of your solution, watch this video right here. See you on the next one.